Hi everybody. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and finish the letter from Birmingham Jail. And I had just finished reading this passage in 3081 where he talks about the, the, the moderate. Okay, the moderate people, the ones who kind of sort of timidly shy away and say, okay, you know, you deserve this, but we got to wait a little longer. Why don't you do it this way? Okay, I really liked that. Um, I actually had a friend once tell me, he was an older gentleman, um, he told me once, he said, I would rather be somewhere where I know that I'm hated than sort of just being given backhanded compliments. He goes, I want to know what I'm up against. Okay, and that's what he's talking about here. Okay, at the end, he's like, I'd rather kind of deal with somebody who just doesn't want me around and somebody sort of just just uh, playing it um, just playing a role if that makes any sense okay so that, I thought that was really interesting that he put that in there because we often see the cases of um, segregation as just basically black and white good guys and bad guys and he's like no there's a gray area there the people who are in that gray area who will not really choose a side properly it's like yeah those he said that those are probably the, the um the greater threats to freedom Let's continue looking at 3083. Okay, the third full paragraph. Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. The yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself, and that is what has happened to the American Negro. Something within within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom, and something without has reminded him that it can be gained. Consciously or unconsciously, he has been caught up by the zeitgeist. And with his brothers in Africa and his brown and yellow brothers of Asia, South America, and the Caribbean, the United States Negro is moving with a sense of urgency toward the promised land of racial justice. If one recognizes this vital urge that has engulfed the Negro community, one should readily understand why, people, why public demonstrations are taking place. Okay. Um, please go down to the bottom of the page. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them they hate you, and pray for them that have this despitefully use you and persecute you? Was not Amos an extreme, extremist for justice? Let justice roll down, roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Was not Paul an extreme, extremist for the Christian gospel. I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. And John Bunyan. I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a butchery, a butchery of my conscience. And Abraham Lincoln. This nation cannot survive half slave, half free. And Thomas Jefferson. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So the question is not whether or not we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists will we be? Will be will we be extremists for love or for hate? Okay. And remember that extremists for hate because there. Um, I usually teach these two works uh, in conjunction with um, Malcolm X, but we didn't have time this semester, so I just stuck with MLK. But they're usually seen as the different co different um, faces of a coin, right? You see the um, the one that was that that stands for um, non-violent protest, and then of course Martin Luther and ML, um, Malcolm X is seen so, sort of as somebody who advocates more violence. I disagree with it. I think that's incredibly simplistic, but a lot of people see it that way. And what um, Mr. Dr. King here is saying is, he's like, look, it's going to get worse. Okay, so he's saying we are extremists here for for love. Okay, they're trying to find peace. There's going to be someone coming up, maybe later, who will be an extremist for hate. So this has to come to an end somehow. Okay. Let's um, continue. We're almost done. I know you all want to get to the big one. Um, 3086. I hope the church as a whole, because remember, this is still a letter, okay? I hope the church as a whole will meet the challenge of this decisive hour. But even if the church does not come to the aid of justice, I have no despair about the future. I have no fear about the act, the outcome of our struggle in Birmingham, even if our motives are at present misunderstood. We will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation because the goal of America is freedom. Wow, that's so great. What is America? What it is? It's freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with America's destiny. Okay, remember America and I? Yeah, yeah. 
this is cool. Before the pilgrims lasted a, a, a Plymouth, we were here. Before the pen of Jefferson etched this majestic words of the Declaration of Independence across the pages of history, we were here. For more than two centuries, our forefathers labored in this country without wages. They made cotton king. They built the homes of their masters while suffering gross injustice and shameful humiliation. And yet, out of a bottomless vitality, they continue to thrive and develop. If the inexpressible... I'm sorry, if the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, the, the opposition we now face will surely fail. We will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and our eternal will of God are embodied in the echoing demands. Okay, that is such beautiful writing. Okay, and it reminded me of what Dr. Maya Angelou told Tupac, remember in our lecture earlier, that she said, do you, do you realize that our people stood on, um, on selling blocks? For you to be here okay i love that line okay because he is mentioning slavery but he's saying slavery made us stronger and here we are okay that paragraph is just beautiful and he's he's um this is a great barb at those segregationists who kept pushing pushing segregation forward he's like no you guys are going to lose we're going to win eventually okay, we don't know how long it's going to take but we're going to win and let's look at, look at the very bottom paragraph at 3087 and we'll finish if I have said anything in this letter that overstates truth and indicates an unreasonable impatience, I beg you to forgive me. If I have said anything that understates the truth and ind indicates my having a patience that allows me to settle for anything less than brotherhood, I beg God to forgive me. I hope this letter finds you strong in your faith. I also hope that circumstances will soon make it possible for me to meet each, each of you, not as an integrationalist or as a civil rights leader, but as a fellow clergyman and Christian brother. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. And in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty, yours in the cause of peace and brotherhood, Martin Luther King Jr. This was in 1963. Okay, so chronologically speaking, this is first. All right, so he was in jail. He wrote this letter, brings a lot of attention to Birmingham. And then we have the I Have a Dream speech. The I Have a Dream speech was given during the Washington Mark, um, the March, the, the March on Washington um, on August the 28th, 1963. Okay, 63 was a really big year. Um, later on in September, there's a horrible tragedy in 63. In November, we lose a great president in 63. Okay, the 60s were massive upheaval. Okay, now people are saying that 2020 is going to destroy us. Y'all, we, y'all, this country lived through the 60s. Okay, the 60s were, the 60s, the 60s were lit and not in a good way. We lost a lot of good people in the 60s. Um, let's look at the I Have a Dream speech. You all have heard of it. You all know it. Um, so I'm going to sort of um, bring up a couple of um, items here. So if we look at 3072, um, I have posted both the audio link to I Have a Dream and the video link. Okay, I'm only going to show you the very end of the, of the video link. Um, but definitely this is something that's going to be really important. Okay, so I Have a Dream. Um, I am happy to join with you today and what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. Five score years ago, a great American in whose symbolic shadow we stand today, this was at the, at the um, Lincoln Memorial, okay? Um, doo -doo -doo, has signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Proclamation. This momentous decree came as great beacon of light of hope to millions of Negro slaves who had been seared in the flames of withering injustice. What a line, right? Seared in the flames of withering injustice. What a tragic, what a sad line, but what a true line, right? Because remember, many African American slaves were, were branded. Okay, so they were seared with the withering injustice. It came as a joyous daybreak to the to end the long night of their captivity. But 100 years later, the Negro is still not free. 100 years later, the life of the Negro is still sadly crippled by the manacles of segregation and chains of discrimination. One, 
Hundred years later, the Negro lives on a lonely island of poverty in the midst of a vast ocean of material prosperity. One hundred years later, the Negro is still languished in the corners of American society and finds himself in exile in his own land. So we've come here today to dramatize a shameful condition. Okay, so right off the bat, just like in Birmingham, he's like, this is the problem. Okay, a hundred years after the Emancipation Proclamation, nothing has changed. Okay, we need... We need bigger change, okay? We need something something big to happen. This is, like I said, right after Birmingham. This is the March on Washington. Yo, there are, I posted the video under um, our video links. Please, please, please take a look at it, okay? I am not making this speech justice. Look at it when he's speaking it. Look at the people in the crowd. This is an amazing crowd. It is huge um, in Washington, D.C. In a sense, we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check. Okay, this is such a great paragraph. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the, the inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious that, that America has defaulted on its promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring the sacred obligation, America has given the Negro a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. So, it makes me, it makes me smile when we have a comparison between Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and um, Malcolm X and the rhetoric of both and the actions of both and how Dr. Martin Luther King is sort of seen as this sort of gentleman, and, and he was, he was a gentleman, he wasn't violent, but his rhetoric hurts. Okay, his rhetoric is biting, and uh, it's what I love about him, is he shows that words can be just as effective, if not even more effective than violence, okay? And this paragraph, it's like, hey, uh, pay up, you owe us. Okay, hang on, guys. All right. Hey, um... He, he keeps going and he talks about racial injustice. Let's go to the bottom of 3073. So, I'm sorry, yeah, 3073. We cannot walk alone. And when we walk, we must make the pledge that we will always march ahead. We cannot turn back. There are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro <clears throat> is the victim of unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with the fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of highways and the hotels of cities. Okay, so we've heard this already, right? The police brutality, they can't find lodgings in a, in a motel because it's segregated. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We cannot be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating for whites only. Okay, that's again making reference to children. He had three, he had four children. Okay, I'm going to tell you something about his kids right now. He had four children, so he knew what the children were going through. Okay, and, and I've talked about this, right? When a child is being told, your culture is bad, this is good, you're ugly, this is beautiful, your music is far less superior than our music, the child starts believing it and starts um, sort of ingesting this, um, this idea that they're somehow lesser. And it's very difficult. You see this in a lot of kids. And it's much more difficult to raise a child that's aware of culture than you think. It's a lot harder. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negroes in Mississippi cannot vote, and the Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied, and we will not be satisfied until justice rules down like waters and righteousness like a, like a mighty stream. Okay, and that's, of course, making reference to the Hebrew prophet Amos. Okay, then begins the very famous the lines, right? I say to you today, my friends, that so even as we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out its true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day the red hills of 
the, that on the red hills of Georgia, sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama, with its racist, with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and little black girls will be able to join with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. Okay, so this... He's, he's like just um, just building up right to the last um, scene. He's building up. This is, I mean, beautiful. Like I said, guys, the rhetoric is so beautiful. If you were, to, there's a website um, called AmericanRhetoric.com. Go there. That this is the number one speech on there in all of American rhetoric. Okay, this is the first one. I mean, we're talking speeches by by um, Abraham Lincoln, by um, John F. Kennedy, by RFK, by RFK, um, by Reagan, by Bush, by Obama. We're talking about all these speeches. This is the the first one that comes up. Okay. So he talks about, you know, I have a dream. This will be the day, the day when all of God's children, we're in 375, will be able to sing with new meaning, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty, of thee I sing, land where, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrims pride from any mountainside, let freedom reign. And, and if, if America is to be a great nation, this must be true. So let freedom ring for the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening allergenies. allergenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Okay, so he talks about that. And I want to show you all this. Oh, look, that's my favorite player. My favorite Liverpool player for your final exam is Jordan Henderson. Okay. All right, let's go. It's going to be very distorted. Okay, and I'm sorry, but the quality isn't great. Okay, y'all, this is the 60s. You should be grateful it even exists. Yeah, hang on, hang on. Those are, okay, so you really can't see it here, okay? Not HD digital quality. Okay, so this is the Potomac River. Those are all people. Okay, so there are people here, people lining down the Potomac. It is an amazing sight. Um, the video that I have posted, is the, the, the quality is a little clearer, but it's oh. really long. Sorry about that. My eight-year-old's playing video games and he forgets that we're filming. Um, but there are tons of people here, and you see the crowd. You heard the crowd. I mean, just have this amazing reaction to him. Um, yeah, but that's the great line, right? Free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last, all right? So August 28th, 1963, great things are gonna happen, right? We're excited. Um, looks like, um, 63, oh, so John F. Kennedy is still alive. Kennedy is, all the Kennedys are very, very involved in the um, civil rights. Okay, we talked about the Kennedys being involved. Robert Kennedy with um, Cesar Chavez, John F. Kennedy and Bobby were involved with um, Martin Luther King as well. They wanted change. Um, so we're going to go here. Unfortunately, um, good things happen, but also really, really bad things happen. And in September of 1963, in Birmingham, something absolutely atrocious happens. And yes, this has a lot to do with Martin Luther King. So we're going to read this. Okay, we're going to see this. I wish I could show you the documentary Spike Lee um, directed about the Birmingham bombing. I can't because copyright and I don't want to be shut down. So we're going to watch this short video right now. Okay, there. You okay? We good? Uh -huh. Okay. I lost the cursor. Okay, right there. It was the oldest black church in Birmingham and it was fairly large. And so it made sense that meetings would happen there, uh, which would also make it a target. On Sunday morning, September 15th, it was youth day, right after Sunday school. Adam A. Collins, Carol Robinson, Denise McNair, and Cynthia Wesley are getting ready uh, to go into the choir. 
I remember Ed, I was closest to Ed, and we would go to church picnics. Ed and I just gravitated to each other. Cynthia Wesley was a friend of mine. She was at my school, she was a ninth grader. Just started in September, and I was an 11th grader. I remember Denise back there always smiling that she was the only child, and I remember Carol Robinson being quiet as she played in the orchestra at her school. And Denise's sister Sarah is also in that ladies lounge. Sarah said the last thing that she remembers is uh, seeing them helping each other tie on sashes and then it went dark. talking about an explosion that reverberates through the entire city of Birmingham. Everybody heard it. I was at South Ableton Baptist Church, and our pastor was shifting kind of nervously across the room and said he had received word that 16th Street Baptist Church had been bombed. I was in Sunday school class, the building seemed like it was shaking off its foundation, fumes, smelling fumes, and getting hit in the head. I couldn't find my younger sister. Only later to find out that she was taken to the hospital, she was only four. She was cut in the head, blood dripping down her clothes and down her face. Reverend John Cross comes down after the explosion to go into the hole and hears moaning. My father heard somebody saying, Addy, Addy. And he realized that Sarah was calling her sister's name because that's the last voices that she heard before the explosion occurred. They find the bodies in there almost literally stacked on top of each other. He said it was like they had been blown together. It devastated me. It was just so painful to know that these girls were killed at church. They had not done anything to deserve something like that. That was enough to pull people off the fence. Kids are supposed to be safe at church. This is not supposed to happen in America. We're above this kind of thing. And so this was the catalyst to get some things moving. And it was the catalyst. This changed it. Dr. Um, Dr. King was able to gain people um, with to gain people um, to follow him in the civil rights movement with his letters and with his rhetoric. This changed it. Okay, because four little girls were killed in this bombing. It it just it changed it changed Al it changed Birmingham. It changed Alabama. It changed the United States. Um, so now is the forefront. Okay, now people are more people are paying attention. People that usually wouldn't be paying attention are looking at their children and realizing somebody lost their daughter. Okay, um, if you can watch the um, the HBO documentary, it's really really great to watch. A couple of things before you leave. Um, Dr. King was, um, he, he lived, he lived, um, he lived with constant death threats. Okay, what he was doing was not very popular for some people. And at a speech that he gave in 19, what was this? This is called the I've Been to the Mountaintop speech. It's his last speech that he gave, April the 3rd, 1968. Okay, so six, at the end of 63, we have the Birmingham bombing, and then we have the death of JFK. Okay, big events. 1968, April 3rd, 1968, he gives a speech, okay, and the last part of the speech was this one. Um, mind you, like I said, he had death threats, I think his, his house was bombed, I mean, these horrible things are happening, and he says, and I quote, I don't know what will happen now, we've got some difficult days ahead, but it really doesn't matter to me because I've been to the mountaintop, and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not th get there with you. But I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm so happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. So this is the speech, and um, on April, 
where are we doing? April 4th, 1968. He is in um, the Loring Memphis Motel in Memphis, Tennessee, and he is shot. And he dies. Um, this is the 60s, though. Okay, this is still telegrams. This is still uh, phone calls. We don't know. Like, the, the news is not what it is now. Okay, God forbid something like this happens, we find out right away. Right, when Kobe died, what happened? Okay, instant, instant communication. Okay, I want to show you all this video. How much time do we have? Four. Four minutes. Oh, you got to be kidding me. No, we need another, we need another video. Okay, sorry guys, we're going to get this one short. We're going to go to another one. Sorry.